Wu Meiyi was born in the Chinese port city of Dalian on June 25, 1985, but moved to Chicago with her husband at the age of 20, where she changed her name to Amber Ayaz. Amber's first two years in the US were both the happiest and saddest of her life, as the birth of her daughter, Melissa, in 2007 was quickly followed by the death of her husband, who passed away from cancer. The ensuing heartbreak and financial issues saw Amber and Melissa briefly move back to China, but with the support of her family, they soon returned to the United States before settling in Las Vegas. Within a decade, Amber had established a prosperous grocery business that specialised in seafood, and in a city that consumes over 60,000 pounds of shrimp every day, that business made Amber a very wealthy woman. Once her business was firmly established, and she had secured a future for her daughter Melissa, Amber began to venture into the Las Vegas dating scene, and it was in 2017 that she met an Uber driver by the name of Cheng Zhang. According to those that knew her, Amber's relationship with Cheng grew very intense very quickly. The couple became so entangled that some assumed they were already married. Despite that intensity, their relationship was a volatile one. 2018 saw the couple briefly separate, but shortly after their reconciliation, Amber, Cheng and Melissa moved to Irvine, California, ready to begin a new life together. Amber's friends and employees were very sad to see her leave, but she continued to run her business from her new home, and frequently made trips back to Las Vegas in order to check that things were functioning as they should. She often kept in touch with employees and regular customers via WeChat, a Chinese messaging app similar to WhatsApp, and would usually reply to a person's message within minutes of receiving it. So, in November of 2019, when Amber suddenly stopped replying to messages and returning phone calls, those that knew her became very worried. On November 22nd, Amber had been on her way back to Irvine from Las Vegas, with a car packed full of fresh fruit and seafood. Cheng had expected Amber to return to their Mitchelson Drive apartment in the mid-afternoon, and became concerned when she failed to arrive when expected. Then, at around 4.30pm, he claimed that two visitors came to his apartment. Cheng didn't recognise either of them, but noted that they were a man and a woman of East Asian descent. Right as he was about to ask who they were, Cheng said that the female pulled something out of her pocket. The last thing Cheng remembered before everything went black was a kind of fine mist wafting over his face. A few hours later, Cheng woke up on his dining room floor, unable to remember how he had gotten there. But just seconds later, memories of the mysterious couple at his door came flooding back. Not long after, Cheng was overcome by terror when he noticed a single bloody handprint on the wall. Staggering out of the room, he spotted even more blood on the hallway carpet. Realising that his stepdaughter might be in danger, he began calling out to her while searching the apartment. To his horror, Melissa was nowhere to be found. As he rushed to contact the authorities, he discovered something terrifying. A handwritten note next to his phone. The note informed him that both Amber and Melissa had been kidnapped but would eventually be allowed to return home if Cheng followed some simple instructions. The final passage read, If you contact the police, you won't see them again. Clean the apartment. Act normal. We are watching you. Terrified that the kidnappers' ominous warnings were legit, Cheng set about covering up the evidence of the crime to ensure Amber and Melissa's safety. He began by ripping up the square of carpet that had been stained with blood. Then he repainted the wall where the bloody handprint had been. He also contacted Melissa's school, claiming she wouldn't be attending class due to serious illness, and even impersonated Amber using her WeChat account to assure her customers that she was fine. Over the days that followed, as Cheng continued to obey the hostage taker's instructions, a series of anonymous letters were slid under his apartment door while he was out. One assured him that his behaviour was being closely monitored. Another told him that if he continued to keep the ordeal a secret for just a few days longer, Amber and Melissa would be released. 
On the fifth day, another anonymous note arrived. This one instructed Cheng to leave town for a few days so that the hostage takers could access the apartment. Cheng capitulated and drove over to a relative's house in Las Vegas under the pretense of a surprise visit. For the next two days, he continued to hide the truth regarding the disappearance of his partner and stepdaughter, acting completely normal before driving back to his Irvine apartment. When he arrived home, another note awaited him. One which read, They are fine. Clean the carpet again. Clean the house again. You will see them Monday. Cheng patiently waited for the return of his family. But when Monday came and went, and he still hadn't received any kind of update, his worry turned to panic. As the situation dragged into its third week, and the hostage takers still hadn't made contact, Cheng began to fear the worst. On December 2nd, 2019, Cheng Zhang finally contacted the Irvine Police Department and reported that his family had been taken. At first, the detectives found Cheng's story extremely suspicious. Due to how long and convoluted it was, they believed it sounded an awful lot like a cover story, and initially considered him the prime suspect in his family's disappearance. However, following an extensive 44-day period of constant surveillance, a complete search of his apartment, and over 40 hours of thorough interviews with friends and family, Cheng was, amazingly, ruled out as a possible suspect, and his story was deemed to be credible. Sections of the bloodstained floorboards Cheng had scrubbed and covered up were sent off for laboratory analysis, and a DNA test confirmed that the blood belonged to Amber. Cheng seemed distraught at the idea of his partner being injured during the kidnapping. But, despite the convincing levels of grief that he displayed, a few things just didn't add up. Firstly, Cheng appeared to have what's known as a defensive wound on his hand, and although he said the cut came from a slip of a knife while cutting meat, the slice resembled the kind incurred during a confrontation. Secondly, a number of Cheng's neighbours had witnessed him hauling one large cooler and one large storage container out of his apartment and down to a waiting truck. When asked about this by police, Cheng claimed that he had just been cleaning the apartment like the perps had instructed. Another aspect of Cheng's story which seemed odd was his claim that he had been knocked unconscious by some kind of aerosol. He was adamant that a female stranger had sprayed him in the face with something and dismissed the idea that she had used a chloroform soaked rag. Investigators deduced that it was possible she had used the anaesthetic spray, halothane, which can render a person unconscious almost immediately. But the thing is, halothane is not exactly an over-the-counter substance in the US. In fact, it's extremely hard to get a hold of. However, one country has a long history of using halothane during espionage operations. And would you believe it? That country is the People's Republic of China. But what would the Chinese government want with a young businesswoman and her 12-year-old daughter? And had they been murdered, or were they being held prisoner somewhere? A considerably less fantastical explanation for Amber's kidnapping could well be her financial situation. Amber had convinced almost everyone, including Cheng, that she was a very wealthy woman with millions in investments and six figures in her bank account. Despite those claims, however, the investigators uncovered that she had vastly exaggerated her success. The truth was, her bank accounts were drained, and her business was on the verge of collapsing. This raised some interesting questions. Had Amber gotten involved with Chinese mafia loan sharks in order to keep up her successful businesswoman image? Had she upset the wrong people with her deception? Did her captors think that she would pay for her and her daughter's release with money that, in reality, she didn't have? Cheng also mentioned that Amber had an on-again, off-again relationship with a man back in China, and that was the reason for their brief separation in 2018. Some began to speculate whether Amber had staged her own kidnapping in order to throw Cheng off her scent and escape. But if her financial situation was so dire, how was she able to finance a delicately timed operation that involved a rare and powerful tranquilizer? 
Not to mention, Amber and Melissa's passports have both been left in the apartment, and there's absolutely no record of either of them entering China since they vanished. Many people who have dug around in this rabbit hole have concluded that Cheng must be a master manipulator and a highly skilled liar. In their minds, his story is simply too crazy to believe, and he must have murdered his partner and stepdaughter before successfully covering it up. And yet, in January of 2020, he passed an FBI-administered polygraph test, showed no signs of deception during his 44 days of surveillance, and an FBI behavioral psychologist confirmed that he was definitely telling the truth and could be ruled out as a suspect. Not to mention, the authorities likely wouldn't have even known about Amber and Melissa's case if Cheng himself hadn't reported it. If Cheng is indeed telling the truth, it makes for a terrifying story, and might well constitute either a human trafficking ring, or even an act of espionage on American soil. Either way, whoever is responsible seems to have acted with complete impunity, and poses a great risk to the wider public. They have never been identified, and Amber and Melissa's whereabouts and well-being remain a mystery to this day. At approximately 6.30pm on August 7th, 1973, Darlene Ross of Fontana, California was listening to her small citizen band radio when she heard something that made her blood run cold. The voice of a young boy crying out, Help! Please help me! through the buzz of the static. Naturally, Darlene was horrified and attempted to calm the child before asking him to provide more details of the danger he faced. The boy told her that his father was dead, but to Darlene's confusion, the boy began addressing her as David. Given the severity of the situation, she brushed off this slip-up and continued to gather more information. She eventually learned that the boy's name was Larry, that he was six years old, and that he was calling from New Mexico. When Darlene asked him for more details, the boy's voice was overcome with static before it disappeared completely. Darlene immediately contacted the Albuquerque Police Department to pass on what little she knew of Larry's situation. She then telephoned a local newspaper called the Albuquerque Journal, whose journalists were so disturbed by the story that they published an article on the boy in the following morning's paper. By the evening of August 8th, the Albuquerque Journal was inundated with callers from all over North America, each claiming to have also heard Larry's terrified voice over their CB radios. As it turned out, Larry's voice had been caught in what's known as an ionospheric skip, meaning a certain weather pattern had temporarily boosted the boy's radio signal. As news of the bizarre phenomenon spread, more and more people began trying to get in contact with Larry. Soon. Another caller claimed to have gathered even more information from the young boy, telling the authorities that the six-year-old was stuck in the cab of an overturned pickup truck, with no food or water, next to his father's lifeless body. The boy had tearfully told the caller that he was hot and thirsty, and that he couldn't get out of the vehicle. New Mexico search and rescue personnel began an urgent and intensive search of the state's highways and byways, and collaborated with the New Mexico State Police the Wing Civil Air Patrol, and the Albuquerque Citizens Radio Association, also known as ARCA. After contacting several people who claimed to have previously spoken with Larry, a representative of ARCA told law enforcement that the boy was most likely somewhere in southern New Mexico. In response, the Civil Air Patrol scoured the region from the air, using aircraft equipped with state-of-the-art radio direction finders while state police and civilian volunteers combed through the foothills of southeast Albuquerque's Sandia Mountains. In the meantime, the New Mexico State Police kept in contact with Larry as best they could. Due to the boy's near constant wailing and crying, and the fact that he didn't seem familiar with the area, figuring out his exact location was impossible. However, thanks to the help of amateur radio operators, Investigators were able to pinpoint Larry's radio signal to just south of a cement factory in a place known as Tejeras Canyon. A 
small army of search and rescue personnel assembled at the factory, but failed to locate Larry in any of the derelict trucks or cars. The Civil Air Patrol then sighted an abandoned truck just east of the Manzano Mountains. As the sun began to set on August 8th, Larry, who was still on the radio, was asked to yell into his microphone if he could spot the landing lights of a plane over the Manzanos. Investigators believed they had made a major break in the case when Larry yelled as a plane flew over a place called Chilili. But after search and rescue personnel scoured the area, no trace of any truck could be found. Later that evening, when asked if he believed that Larry's distress signal could be a hoax, a sergeant in the Civil Air Patrol stated, quote, I've never had any doubt that this is the real thing. I've personally heard the kid crying, and I just can't believe that someone would fake something like this. By Thursday of August 9th, increasingly desperate search teams were following every lead, no matter how far-fetched, as the extreme heat of southern New Mexico meant that anyone trapped without water was in extreme danger. By the end of the day, the New Mexico State Police Headquarters had been utterly bombarded with tips, some from as far away as New York, but the high volume of calls meant that the investigation was quickly spiralling into a mess of false leads and fraudulent reports. Some people were intentionally trying to hamper the investigation for their own sick amusement, and soon there were so many people, good and bad, tuned in to the same radio channel talking to Larry that the chatter became relentless and Larry himself couldn't get an open mic to speak. The following morning, as the search group sorted through conflicting reports of Larry's whereabouts, the boy's weakening signal suggested that his portable CB radio was running out of batteries. The rescue teams were running out of time, and by this point, the sweltering heat of the New Mexican summer would be pushing little Larry to his limits. New Mexico State Chief of Police, Martin E. Vigil, then publicly pleaded with parents to confiscate their children's walkie-talkies, and later appealed to CB operators to keep Channel 14 clear, as that was the band that Larry was transmitting on most. But just when both Larry and his radio seemed to be on death's door, the authorities received a call from a CB alert operator from Phoenix, Arizona, claiming that they had just heard a panic transmission from a young man who called himself David. David claimed to have been involved in a serious traffic accident, and for a brief period, he and his father had been trapped in the wreckage of their upturned vehicle. However, unlike Larry, who was telling everyone that his father was dead, David said that both he and his father were fine and now free of the wreckage. Given that Larry had used the name David in his first transmission, possibly in reference to a brother or cousin, this led many people to believe that the two calls were connected. Some suggested that the situation was resolved, and that Larry's family had rescued him after escaping the wreckage of their truck. And yet, just a few hours later, another of David's distress calls could be heard coming over the CV radio networks. To one faction of the investigative team, this meant the search for Larry should continue, while another faction believed that David's transmission marked its end. All the while, the voices of those who believed that Larry was a hoax grew louder and louder, and before long, the investigation was in tatters. With law enforcement essentially forced to admit that many of Larry's broadcasts were cruel pranks committed by bored teenagers, the general public began to grow increasingly jaded with the investigation. So, in one last push to rescue young Larry, a US Air Force plane fitted with special radio direction finders performed a final flyover of New Mexico listening out for Larry's signal. Sadly, the high-tech aircraft was unable to pick up his CB transmission, but according to the pilot, that didn't mean it wasn't broadcasting. If a CB radio network is too busy, it's just too difficult to scan for singular transmissions, and there was still a slim chance that Larry was still alive. Shortly afterwards, investigators were angered and appalled when a boy in Phoenix, Arizona, confessed to being behind the David transmission, meaning the investigation had stalled over nothing but a cruel prank. Just five days into the operation, search and rescue teams were forced to consider the real possibility that Larry had died from exposure or dehydration, and that their lack of urgency when it mattered most had caused the poor boy's death. By the end of the investigation, 
Hundreds of police officers, National Guardsmen, and civilian volunteers utilised over 22 different aircrafts to scour the southwestern United States, but not a single trace of Lost Boy Larry was ever found. The search for Larry ended up being one of the most expensive search and rescue operations in New Mexican history, costing the equivalent of three quarters of a million dollars in today's money. Many have lamented that such a huge amount of money was spent investigating nothing more than a prank, while others have accused those crying hoax of trying to shield themselves from the grim reality that a young boy perished in the hot New Mexican sun. After all, the voice was definitely that of a young boy's. Larry had been crying over the radio near constantly for three to five days, begging for help. If this was a hoax, the kid behind it had been extremely dedicated. Since no other voices were heard coming from his end, you'd think that the boy would get bored of carrying on a prank like this by himself for hours every day. And yet, he continued. He'd also have had to been unsupervised for all of that time. It's possible the only reason Larry never told anyone his surname or home address was because of his age. That's to say, he may have been even younger than six, and lied about his age as not to get in trouble for using his father's radio. He may also have been so young that he didn't even know his address. What's more, it's totally possible that he was trying to answer some of the questions posed to him, but so many people had hopped on the same radio channel that Larry's voice just got lost in the crosstalk. A journalist from the Albuquerque Journal later wrote, Larry was never found, but because of that search, numerous other lives have been saved. She was referring to the New Mexico Search and Rescue Council, who had since dedicated themselves to learning the lessons that Lost Boy Larry had taught them, which improved the state's search and rescue methods in turn. This meant that even if Larry's radio transmissions had all been a cruel and elaborate hoax, the end result was a net positive for the state of New Mexico. But if a young boy really did have to die in order for such a system to be put in place, it's as heartbreaking as it is horrifying to be reminded that some rules are written in blood. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. Just before the video ends, I'd like to say a big thank you to Sam Riding for writing the script for this one. Also a huge thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Jacqueline Guevara Phelan, Hamish K, Torpid Chair 1139, Nephus 1988, Lydia Cumo, Jesse Jug, Alex Greensall, Anya Yekaterina Faustov, Asia Mina, Azriel Warakai, Colin Monsma, Chief Kochuake, Expan Dong, George Lopez, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Ian Billock, Infamous Sempapi, Kawaii Evil, Larry Mattingly, Leonardo Martinez, Lyndon Witebski, Monica Mendoza, Natalie Escobedo, Peter Logdrach, Philip Wester, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, Zane, Brad Hammer 33, Mrs. Avon Rankin, and the Deck of Cards. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. Remember to smash that like button, or I'll smash you, and you'll be hearing from me again very soon. Until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.